what might be looking back in a hundred years' time? Uh, what, what are you? What are your thoughts on AI? And um, I assume you've you're aware of what Bostrom has been saying about it. If if you haven't actually read his book Super Intelligence, so well, yeah, give me your give me your take on AI. And you know, I, I just uh, recently drunk the Kool Aid here. It's been about a year since I've been thinking about AI, and it was you know Bostrom's book was the the first input, and I've grown worried about the the safety concerns, you know, the control problem, as he calls it. And I'm um, just wondering what your thoughts are there. Yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in uh, AI. And I think there's a lot of reasons for, there certainly are reasons for concern. I did my, uh, my PhD in an AI lab, actually, at uh, Indiana University. Doug Hofstetter, who wrote Goethe Lescherbach and so on, was my, uh, was my thesis advisor. And he's, he was basically doing uh, AI, as he, uh, as he still is. And so I've always been very sympathetic with the, uh, with the whole AI project, but you do have to take seriously this idea about what happens when machines become as intelligent as we are. I actually wrote an article on this maybe six years ago now called The Singularity, a Philosophical Analysis, where I tried to take this idea which is out there and turn it into a philosophical argument that roughly when machines are become a bit smarter than we are, they'll be a bit better than us at designing machines. Therefore, they'll end up designing machines a bit smarter than them. And that process will just continue recursively until fairly soon you have machines that are way smarter than we are, which presumably leads to massive, massive ramifications for, uh, for what happens in the world. And you know, in the article I wrote on this, I, I basically took the line, yes, this is a, you can turn that informal argument into a fairly rigorous argument that, that it's in fact pretty likely that something like this will happen. I mean, certain fairly strong conditions would have to hold for AI not to be possible of this kind. One thing worth noting is that the considerations about consciousness can almost be set to one side here because all that really matters for us, like from the point of view of self-interest, is the behavior of these machines. If it turns out they're unconscious zombies who are taking over the world, well, that's not much consolation for us. So, uh, Yeah. Well, it, it, it's interesting because I've heard at least one computer scientist talk about this, and he just, he, he took a line that was I guess, analogous to uh, Nozick's utility monster thought experiment, where he, he basically said that we are, in creating these super intelligent, even godlike AIs, we will be creating, almost by definition, he didn't seem to acknowledge any possibility otherwise, that we'll be creating systems that are more conscious and therefore more ethically important than we are. And we'll be creating gods We'll be creating the utility monsters whose interests outweigh our own by, you know, a functionally infinite degree, and this is the most glorious thing we will ever have a hand in doing, and it really doesn't matter that they may trample upon our interests and even annihilate us, no more than it matters that we occasionally trample upon anthills or anything else that, is, that has interests that are less significant compared to our own. But what he didn't seem to entertain, which seems to be a, you know, we've touched on briefly, uh, it's certainly a real concern for me, it seems to be a possibility that we could build systems that are far more intelligent than we are, that we, in the sense that they're far more competent at solving problems, including the problem of designing further iterations of themselves or recursively self-improving their own software, which is to say we can get a, a we can initiate what has been called an, an intelligence explosion, and yet there will be nothing that it's like to be these machine. So that in, in some sense, it's, it's ethically the worst case scenario where we've built something that can destroy us simply because it, it may not be aligned with our interests and gobble up all of our resources, uh, including our own atoms, to, to follow Bostrom's thought experiment. But the, the lights will not be on. The universe will be dark when populated by these machines. Yeah, now that would certainly be a shame. Uh, to stamp, yeah. <laughs> stamp, we've, we're creating our successes and we think, okay, well, at least this is the glorious future of evolution. But if it turns out to be the step that stamps out consciousness, then suddenly the world is going to lose all of its meaning and value for, uh, for, uh, for everyone. Uh, one thing that I think is worth contemplating here, people think about, okay, we're creating our own successes, we won't be around, but um, there's really two ways it could go. I mean, look, I suspect that Artificial superintelligence may well be part of the, the uh, you know, the history of the future. But there's two possibilities here, and one of them we're still around, and the other one we're not 
still around. In one model, we design creatures utterly unlike us who take over the world. In another kind of future, we start with us and we enhance ourselves um, and maybe we upload ourselves and so on. So we are the super intelligent creatures in the future, or at least the super intelligent creatures in the future are recognizably versions of us that somehow evolved from us, maybe by some transfer onto different hardware. I mean, that, I think, reduces the distance between those creatures and us. And by the kind of reasoning that you were making earlier, maybe increases the chances that those beings are genuinely going to be conscious like us because they're going to be more closely related to us. I mean, ethically, it's kind of nicer for us, even for our self-interest, because, hey, we'll be there or descendants of us will be there benefiting. Um, and from the point of view of whether there's consciousness there, I mean, of course, you might say, well, at some point, we had to move all this onto faster hardware because the biology was too slow. And I suppose that's going to at least raise the question of where the consciousness gets lost at that point, where we upload ourselves onto the faster technology. I've, one line, I've, I've thought a bit about uh, this whole uploading point in the context of consciousness. One line I'm attracted to is the idea, if you do it gradually, if you update your, if you upgrade your brain a bit at a time with, you know, one neuron replaced by a silicon chip at a time and stay awake throughout, then, uh, you know, maybe there's a case that consciousness is going to be preserved by this process and you'll end up with consciousness at the other end. So I guess I'd say to you, if you're worried about these, uh, these, uh, super, these machines at the other end, uh, being conscious, well, upload yourself slowly and gradually and observe your consciousness carefully and see what happens on route. Well, that's interesting. I, do you think that solves the um, problem, I guess, first introduced by Derek Parfit, the, the, the teletransporter problem? Because it, it seems like uploading has always suggested that it, it, it could just be a matter of copying yourself and then being killed, right? So you, you, the, 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 the normal notion of uploading is you do a, a, we have cracked the neural code, we can now read out every human mind onto some dura more durable substrate now in the matrix or now on our, you know, one of Amazon's servers. And so you can back up your mind, and yet the experience of, of, of having it backed up would just be, it seems, being told, you know, congratulations, Mr. Chalmers, your mind has been successfully backed up. Now you you don't need your meat body anymore. How would that be any different from a murder? And what what you seem to have sketched out here is a process whereby we could gradually integrate our minds by migrating, you know, one functional neuron at a time into the cloud. And if at any point in that process the lights seem to be going out, well, then we could stop it, presumably. But that's so that that's it's an interesting notion of kind of bridging what it's like to be us with what it's like to be in in on some other substrate and removing the fear that it could just all be you know it, it could just all be a matter of of unconscious information processing on, on the other side yeah i think there are actually two distinct worries about uploading when people think about uh you know loading their brain onto a computer one worry about the uploaded version is will it be conscious will there be anyone at home there at all, will the lights be on? And then the second worry is, will it be me? I mean, you could, in principle, have take independent lines on this, hold that, yes, it will be conscious, but it still won't be me. It'll just be a duplicate of me, like making a, a twin of me in the next room. One of these corresponds to the philosophical problem of consciousness. The other one corresponds to the philosophical problem of personal identity, as, you know, as Parfit talks about with his discussion of the teletransporter. But I think this line of doing it gradually can at least has some bearing on both of these uh, both of these worries. If you just create a duplicate of me next door, then it's very tempting to think it's someone, but it's not me. But if it's my brain throughout, and the old neurons get destroyed and replaced by by silicon chips, and it's just one, and I stay conscious throughout, so it's a continuing stream of consciousness. It's at least harder to uh, hold on to the idea or to find persuasive the idea that uh, that um, this being won't be me. I mean, I suppose it's possible. Maybe the meanness could gradually dwindle during this process. And likewise, you could take the line that maybe the consciousness would gradually dwindle during this process. And we'd just be left with functional duplicates at the other end, um, responding normally, but without any consciousness and without being me. I mean, it's hard to be philosophically certain of these things, but I suspect that at least 
the first the first few times, if I'm ever going to do this, then um, you know, the first time I'm going to want it to be uh, want it to be uh, the the gradual way. And I mean, you can although it's interesting, you can kind of if the engineering works well enough, if the simulations are good enough, we know what the simulations are going to say at the other end. If they're at least good simulations of how we are now, they're going to say, "Oh, I'm still conscious. I'm still here because that's what I say now." So you know, there's a. There, I suppose if you're worried that this process is going to produce a whole lot of beings who are not me and who are still zombies, and you're still going to have that that worry. But I do predict that having a few people go through this process is going to be very persuasive to the rest of us. Yeah, but the thing is, if if you they do it in a way that's safe, which is to say, they do it in a way where they maintain their physical body in case the process goes wrong. Well, then they've done it in the in precisely the way where under Parfit it'll be clear it's not them on the other side. So if you maintain your physical brain and you migrate, you know, one, you know, one bit at a time and you get an intact copy of yourself, well, then it'll, it will be a copy of yourself with a, with a different point of view and a, even though it has identical memories to, to your own, it's now, I mean, I, I'm convinced that at least on, on that description of the teletransporter, a copy of yourself really is just a copy. I mean, you're you're uh, about to be murdered, and the, the the man on Mars, who is the exact copy of you, having had all the, the the information in your brain and body read out and sent to Mars and reassembled into your doppelganger, that is just a another person who is who is functionally more or less your equivalent on Mars. But if you if you do it again, this just this this restates Parfit's conundrum whereas if you if you do it the way you're describing where you don't maintain yourself even if perhaps you could reverse the process if you if you didn't like what was happening but if you, if if once the migration is complete you are all in all on the server and your your you know the monkey has been left behind then it, there's a compelling case for it to to be you and yet if you don't do that, and you and you stay, you 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 remain as you are now, outside the matrix, and are simply informed that the the copy is is in, is perfect. Whether or not it's conscious, as you say, there's still going to be a a very strong sense, I think, an inescapable sense that you know that's just another person. Yeah, I mean, I think sociologically, it's um, probably who knows what's going to happen first, but probably it's going to be brain scans and backups. That um, yeah, well, maybe it's going to turn out the best way to create these really convincing downloads is by destructively destroying the brain, a brain, and then scanning it. Maybe we'll do it first in you know worms and mice and so on. But if it ever happens to a human, I don't know. Maybe the first volunteer would be someone who volunteers to. Probably the first human case I predict is going to be a backup. You scan the brain, you keep the original brain around, and then you make a simulated copy, and then you activate the simulation. And if it's a good enough simulation, I suspect we're going to have two reactions. One, yes, that is a person. They're really talking. There's really probably some kind of consciousness there. But also at the same time, that is not the same being as the original, because presumably the original and this new person will be able to have a, chorus, will be able to have a conversation and we'll say, okay, well, these are like twins, but this is the old one. This is the, uh, the new one. So if that's the way that this technology gets introduced, I suspect we may end up going in the direction of thinking that these uh, these copy beings are yes conscious, but no distinct from the original. And th there is then an interesting question sociologically about whether people are going to be willing to go through things like the continuous uploading process. I mean, I think probably what will happen is what could happen is a few of us will start just upgrading bits of our brain with silicon components and say, "Hey, this seems fine. I'm still here." And then you keep doing that, and you'll eventually get to fully silicon systems and People will still take the attitude that we're still here. Then the philosophical and sociological question is going to be, can you justify drawing a distinction between what happens in the case of a straight out copy and what happens in the case of a gradual copy? For example, we have two classes of silicon beings in our society. The ones which are just copies, which have a much more negligible, let's say, legal and ethical status, and the ones which correspond to transformed versions of the original. Which have a higher status that might that situation might come to seem untenable, and I don't really have any clear grip on how all well this would play out. But I think we're going to need some philosophers around to figure it out. Yeah, well, that's interesting. That the idea that if if you copied your mind, as so your mind is your data. If any if anything is your data, your mind is 
is your data that you back up. But if the mere backing it up creates a conscious copy of yourself, do you have the right to delete that copy? I mean, are you, you, are you performing a murder? It seems you would be, I think, uncontroversially, if in fact this being is just as conscious as you are and has all your memories and all your hopes and dreams and aspirations. Yeah, maybe our intuitions are a bit different depending on whether the copy has been activated yet. If it's just, if it's just a record on a disk and it's never yet produced any consciousness, it's just kind of waiting, waiting to be activated, maybe we can delete it. But the moment it's actually been conscious and maybe started going in its own directions and you know got a moment of input and thought its own thought, then now it's its own being. And uh, you know, at this point, I think, yeah, certainly once it's conscious, the thought that you can just deactivate it, well, that's, that's killing a conscious being. And you know, suddenly these beings have to be admitted into our moral circle of concern. Well, the idea that we would proceed based on just merely augmenting our minds or repairing damaged parts of our brains. Actually, I, I heard Elon Musk express this idea as a way of constraining the, I mean, actually as a way of, of solving the control problem in some sense, that we're going to be the limbic systems of these, of these new minds. And our own, va our own values will be playing a role at least in directing the values of these machines. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if that idea originates with him or if, or if he was just restating something someone else had said. I guess one concern I have there, though, is that it seems like, I mean, so, so doing that is more or less synonymous with having reached something like a completed neural, si neural science. We've, we've, we've cracked the code at least to the point where we can seamlessly augment ourselves and give ourselves more mind and then explore the landscape that, that these bigger brains open to us. But it seems like there may just, it may just be an easier problem to solve to, to build functionally super-intelligent AI without having solved that bridging problem to the human brain. And that's going to be done first by definition, because it's easier. And because there's at least people would imagine, people who are not taking the control problem or the safety problem seriously, there's an immense amount of wealth, in fact, a kind of a winner-take-all scenario that awaits anyone who can build such a system. So we're going to get the super-intelligent AI first before we can plug our brains into it and become its limbic system. Yeah, I've heard all kinds of arguments about which one is actually going to be first. I mean, there are these two research projects designing a totally new AI or sort of reverse engineering ourselves. Um, you know, there are considerations on both sides. If uh, certainly the AI system, AI project will be much less constrained by, you know, the limits of science and engineering technology with respect to brains. On the other hand, the brain provides a working system we've got here right now. You might take the view that if these brain activity mapping projects develop enough, then in a, you know, in a couple of decades, we'll have a working map of the brain, and, uh, connect all the connections between them, and maybe even understanding the workings of individual neurons. At some point, we'll get to the, the point of being able to you know, record, record all that onto a computer and simulate it. Now, of course, there could be intermediate points, which is actually where we are right now with the worm, C. elegans, has 302 neurons, and we've mapped all the, uh, all the connections between them um, in a perfect map, but we still can't get a simulation to work because we don't understand the principles of how all the components work well enough. So, but you can imagine a future where in, say, 30 years' time, we understand the, both the mechanisms and the connections well enough just to scan a brain and activate it well before we're in a position to actually design a new AI for scrap from scratch. So I think it's actually an open question which one will come first. But I do suspect that which one comes first is going to make a big difference to what happens after that. I find myself kind of hoping that maybe it'll be the, uh, the brain-based version that comes first, because that ends up looking potentially like a, a future more friendly to uh, human beings. And I've, so, I've got enough self-interest that, well, I've got enough self-interest, I hold out a little sliver of hope that I may actually be there, and, and well, if not me, then at least some relatives or conspecifics or, or something, but give it, give it a few decades and, you know, maybe I still hold out a, a sliver that, some vote, that I could eventually be there and upload myself eventually. Even if there's only a 10% chance that, you know, something like this is going to happen, then boy, we should be at least giving 10% of our heads to, to worrying about this, so to speak, because the consequences are so enormous that, yeah, I don't really understand the dismissive attitude. It's got a science fictional flavor here, but it just seems to be there's 
clearly a, a concern here that everyone ought to at least be uh, ought to at least be thinking about. I mean, people get distracted by time frames. Is it going to happen in ten years? Probably not. Um, but even if it's going to happen in fifty or sixty years, we should be uh, or a hundred years. It's something we need to be thinking about. Yeah. The, the, the most troublesome aspect of it for me is that many people who really should know better, many people who are even doing the work, seem to hold up the, the time frame dismissal as somehow relevant. You know, the people who think it's not going to happen in 10 years, but really are not at all confident that it won't happen in 50, seem to think that that, that uh, means that there's, there's nothing to think about in the meantime, which is which is crazy given how quickly a decade passes. 